Welcome to The Trenches. I'm your host, Rob McCallum. This is our ongoing series of interviews with filmmakers from around the world. Once again, we go north of the border to a guy who's better known as a color, maybe, Mr. Johnny Blue himself, Mikey Gorman. Mike, are you on the line? Oh, yes, I'm here. It's a pleasure. Fantastic. It sounds like you may have a little bit of Johnny Blue in a glass beside you. Any truth to those rumors? Uh, if only that were true. Especially, how much was that glass? Uh, I want to say like, what, 18 to 30 bucks or something like that? I, it was in the high 30s for sure. Okay, high 30s. I'll take your word for it. I actually went to uh, an airport recently and I saw a bottle of Johnny Blue and I... <laughs> I course thought of you but then i saw the 300 dollars price tag and you know yeah. that, <laughs> and that's when i really thought of you but uh thanks I for being on this <laughs> yeah th thanks for being on the show with me today uh of course you i'm sure you've listened into some of our other interviews by now uh now that it's i believe april april something right now but uh why don't you tell our listening audience uh you know who you are what you kind of do and then we'll start uh, meandering through this uh gargantuan list of topics that uh i'd love to cover with you well, I guess at this point you would consider me a screenwriter, full and foremost. I kind of have the mentality of the story comes first. Okay. It's uh, it's probably a good place to start. Um, I, I completely concur with your story comes first model. It's you know it's kind of scary when you start shooting without a script, and we've interviewed people like that before, so that's interesting. Um, so, are you like a full time writer? Do you, do you basically write on spec right now? Uh, you know, do you have a, a separate day job that you just kind of balance with your writing? Like like give us uh, some sort of indication of where you are kind of in your career, um, for better or worse. Okay, well, over the years, I've had a background uh, working on production as a grip, uh, as a boom guy, uh, even a couple of years as a teleprompter. Now, it's not the most exciting job in the world, especially when you've, all you've ever really wanted to do is write. Uh, but at this point in time, I've just gone full on spec writing, and there's a whole number of event, like competitions coming up in the next couple months. So uh, I'm keeping myself pretty busy. So what I like about that is uh, you and I are kind of in the same boat. Um, we are writing on spec to save our life, either to hopefully get something that we love enough to maybe put into production because we both got production experience or, you know, uh, hound friends with favors and uh, plead at, you know, midnight and hold ghetto blasters over our head until they say, yes, we'll develop your, your script. But, uh, you know, this is, this is the, the reality of, I would say, most writers in, uh, in the world. I would say a very small percentage are actually, you know, paid living screenwriters, you know, for lack of a better term, in Hollywood. Um, and, you know, even fewer, of course, that would live outside that geographic re region. So, you know, let's tell people what writing on spec means and then maybe just examine that for a little bit. Okay, uh, the way I would define on spec is you're, it, well, it's exactly a short term for you're writing on speculation. You're writing a story in hopes that someone will be interested in it afterwards compared to a, a, a writer for hire who's been most likely already been successful writing a spec script, for example. Uh, they would then be hired to say write Transformers as just one I'd throw out there. Whereas I'm just writing for the sake of writing in hopes of selling it at some point. You know, if Transformers was written on spec, I could probably be a, a little more forgiving of it, but uh, <laughs> it probably wasn't. Uh, so yeah, I mean, that, that's what it is, writing on spec, essentially writing for free, speculation, hoping to get it out there, draw some attention, kind of calling card type of material. Um, what do you think about writing on spec for hire, you know, where you're hired to write on spec? What, what do you, how do you feel about that? I've actually not quite heard of that scenario till just now, but I can imagine someone like Charlie Kaufman would be the kind of person you'd go to for that, where their talent precedes them and you're ready to take whatever they give you. I guess the question is, if somebody has, you know, wants an idea that's going to go into production, you know, as far as a script, right. um, what do you think about writing it on spec, knowing that it's going to go in production, even though it's not your idea, versus writing something that you're you know you've come up with that you're the content creator on spec that might not go into production right now i kind of understand that view and i'd be very comfortable if it was a short film or something just to get your name uh, onto imdb for example uh as a feature it's uh very tough to work with someone uh, especially when their idea is very set and i, I know when you say it's guaranteed well not guaranteed to be made but just the idea that it could go in any direction afterward. It may not pay off. You're really asking a lot for a spec writer, and usually uh, the reward's not as great, especially when you think of Craigslist. Okay, so let, let, let's let's sweeten the scenario then. Let's say 
Mike, you know me. I can put stuff in production to some degree. Mike, I I got a like a really loose idea for you know a rom com that takes place in cottage country. I just need a good draft. You know, I understand that you don't want to put a lot of time into it because I can't pay you, but I'm gonna get this made. You know me. Will you do it? We know each other personally. I think I'd be more comfortable with that for sure. Okay, so I mean, these are the scenarios that I come across. Now on Craigslist, they they try to treat you like you know, of course, they're your best friend, and you're you're gonna be willing to bend over backwards. And that you know, that's the same thing in the production world. I've I've had a bunch of gigs out here where it's like, oh, you're an editor. Well, uh, you know, maybe you can just you know you know cut all this stuff for me for free, and uh, you know that's cool, right? You know, you don't have a problem with that. And well, of course, you do have a problem with it, but you know, people don't get it. So. I don't know. It's it's like an emerging thing. Like there's there's an allure there, because the ultimate thing is to get your writing produced so that you can have you know something visible to show people. Exactly to get your name out there. Uh, the problem with uh, Craigslist, for example, and I mentioned John August uh, pointing this out on Twitter earlier, uh, or pardon me before the par- before the podcast. Uh, he kind of described the Craigslist article as uh, requesting a screenwriter for uh, roughly a thousand dollars. They want to pay you to write a feature like script, and I always laugh when I hear a director or producer make a request like that because a lot of time and effort usually goes into a script. It's not something you throw together in a weekend. In most cases, you're not exactly like Mike Myers making Austin Powers, for example. Uh, well, let me ask you about this. Um, there, there's that example, and here's something I've done. I've done ghostwriting for people where it essentially works out to a little better than a thousand dollars for a hundred pages one draft um you don't have to go back and rewrite as long as you know it makes sense all the way through and if you just do take some time to do the outline which you don't get paid for um you know as long as you can bang out essentially i don't know like 10 pages a day you know you're talking about 100 bucks to do 10 pages What, what do you think about that it's again. I, I'm always uh, worried that production's going uh, going to fall through in the end. So I'm more of a, especially if you put that much work into something, you don't own it. And I keep seeing all these horror stories, mostly on Craigslist, where someone's offering a thousand dollars, wants you to write an auto, not an autobiography. Well, in a sense, it is because it's being ghostwritten. Right. But a lot of times they're expecting you to make a mountain for next to nothing with little to no credit in the end. Yeah, I mean, this this is actually one of the things I did. I had to take somebody's experience in the insurance industry um, and basically tell the tale of how he and his neighbor got burned by the company that he worked for and then they created this elaborate revenge plot to get them back because the guy knew, of course, all the loopholes in order to do it. Um... And I basically had to write that, so I was hired to do it, and I, I was turning in, you know, ten pages a day. I, I mean, I'm a, I, I would say I'm a fairly fast writer. That on average I will write, you know, ten pages a day, and on a on a good dedicated day when I have a solid outline, I can turn out forty, no problem. It's just a matter of getting that outline to where you know I, I know exactly what happens. And of course, you know, you and I would go back and rewrite our own material over and over and over and over again. But as long right. as A plus B equals C for ghostwriting. It's actually incredibly freeing. I wouldn't necessarily recommend it. Maybe it, maybe as a goof so you can see what it's like and uh, get halfway through the process or something like that and see where it goes. But it was actually, it's a very different approach to, to writing your own stuff because you have that emotional disconnect. It's like you are written, for, you're, you are, you know, basically, uh, you know, hired by assignment and you don't, there's just a distance there that's really comf- comforting on some level. And that's probably the only part I missed because it was just really easy to bang the stuff out and not, not, not that I didn't care, but I wasn't so attached to it. Um, right. I could see where you come from exactly there. I think I have a bit of a curse in that I, I wouldn't say I'm perfectionist, but I hold everything very close to my sleeve. Okay. I can, I can see why that might be difficult then. Um, and then the other thing, you know, on the other side of the coin of ghostwriting or doing stuff on spec for other people that you don't know is you don't know their level of understanding of the process. Like these, I, w- I, I basically got, I was writing two scripts at the same time for this ghostwriting service. So one day I would write 10 pages for one and then the next day I would do 10 pages for the other. And by that third day, I would get notes back on the first stuff. And the notes were always, you know, for the most part, really minimal until one day I got like, 
no, this, you, this, the main character, you haven't written him in here yet. Where is he? This is supposed to be happening. Or how come this character hasn't been in here? You know, I gave you my life story. I want to see this character by this point in the movie. And it's like, well, you agreed to the outline. You saw where that character came in. And it's just really hard to negotiate, I guess, in, in, in some senses, because you're dealing with people that are amateurs, hence why you're not getting paid appropriately for your services. But I don't know. For anybody out there listening that's considering ghostwriting, it's a really fun experience, and it's one that you'll learn from, but you can't make a career from it. You're kind of convincing me to at least try it out so I have a good story to come out of it. <laughs> like, I don't want to get into it too much because I still have a relationship with the people that hired me, and, they, and they've offered me treatments to do. Like, the best thing I got, I think I got 100 bucks to do um, just a query letter, like a one-page synopsis. It was fantastic. I did oh, wow. a one-page you know, kind of treatment that, uh, you know, had the hook, broke it up, you know, acts one, two, and three. And, uh, and it was good. That was a hundred bucks and it took me, okay. It took me an hour, but you know, that's because I had the outline and I did the outline on my own time. And then on the converse side, I got paid $75 to do a four page treatment. And I said, well, you know, if I do this four page treatment for 75 bucks, you'll be, this guy could go and hire anybody to write it because the way I do my treatments are, you know, really in depth that, you know, uh, page one is like act one, act two would be pages two and three and page four would be act three. So there was a bit of back and forth there, but you know, again, it took a day. So that was, you know, another 75 bucks in my pocket. So for quick cash and turnaround, if you have the connections, it can be worth it. It's just, you know, the follow up and dealing with the unprofessionalism and, and going from there. And unfortunately for everybody that's listening, if you want to make it as a writer, these are some of the things that you've got to do to stay afloat, develop your craft, and get income in your pocket. I mean, Mike, what kind of other stuff have you taken on as a writer that's you know not maybe screenplay based or what are right. you do, what are you doing to stay afloat and, and you know continue to be a writer? I guess. Well, at this point, I'm just kind of going full head on. I'm, I'm obviously searching for jobs and. I'm currently living in Toronto just for anything as part-time work, just to, you know, not necessarily stay afloat, but just so I don't have to worry as much as my money dwindles away. <laughs> right, right. Um, so you're working hard. Everybody's working hard, trying to, you know, make the buck to keep doing what we love. It's, 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 you know, it's trying to get that dream. I remember I met an agent in Toronto, the first agent I ever met, and he said, look, if you want to be a writer, you got to go work at Starbucks. You can't work at a job, yeah. especially not corporate video. And right, like, for example, I worked at a call center for two years. Uh, nothing hurt my writing more than dealing with uh, irate customers for you know ten to twelve hours a day. Yeah. So I mean, when you when you deal with individuals like that for whatever reason, and you know, I'm sure part of the time they're in the in the right because shit happens. But you take some of that baggage home with you, and the idea behind go work at Starbucks is once you clock out, you're not taking any baggage home with you, and just go home and write or read scripts and. Right, you nailed it exactly. Like I've learned from just working part-time jobs and such that I don't have writer's block, but I cannot write angry. Yeah, so if I it's... come back from a twelve-hour job really in a bad mood, I cannot write. Yeah, and I got, I would say that I can't write when I'm exhausted. You know, I've really got to kind of be alert. That's not to say that I can't write at night, but if I've you know gone for a run or climbed a mountain or something crazy, and I come back. There's no way that I'm going to be able to sit down for like two, three hours. And you got to give yourself that kind of time because you might exactly. only actually be writing for an hour of it while you're, you know, figuring things out. But I mean, and, and everybody that wants to be a writer out there is writing and, you know, is trying to figure things out. You got to kind of recognize what your strengths are, when the best time for you to write is and just make a schedule around that. When you say it I totally agree with you. Like I find if I try to sit down at my desk and write for four hours, maybe I'll pump out. 10 pages, right. it'll be dribble. But if I go to the gym for two hours, take an hour break, go write for an hour, I can churn out, I would like to say, you know, up to 10 pages of goodness. Right. Yeah. Well, well-crafted material. Goodness coming from the writer. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Fantastic. You got to have some self-delusion. <laughs> so Mike, you, you mentioned that there's a bunch of, you know, writing competitions coming up. And of course, you know, we attended pitch fest i think it was what screen expo in la at the time right, um, it would have been my first trip for myself yeah so let's talk about what maybe a little bit just just now getting it kind of covered early on in the podcast you've got a spec script you believe in 
some people can write a script in two weeks and you know be happy about it some will take years and i know people that are still working on their first screenplay and you know what that that's great you know when you think it's done it's done that's all that matters um tell tell me about the post process you've got a script you've printed it out the title page is on it it's a nice neat stack of 100 to 110 pages of paper on your desk or a digital file somewhere on your computer what what next uh, it's funny enough, I've seen a lot of writers start at like the treatment st stage, do an outline, of course, and then write the screenplay. Uh, I find I have to just write the outline first, screenplay, and then write treatment, log line. Uh, in other words, I, a lot of people try to sell the script first before they actually write the script. And I find, it, at least for myself, it does not work that way. I really have to have a full sense of... I need to have a finished product in my hands. Okay, so let's say you do have that finished script in your hand. What do you do with it? What are, what are your options as, as a guy who's in the grind like me to, what are you gonna do with that finished script that you're proud of? Well, uh, first thing I do is I'll give it to a close friends. Obviously get the, I, I would call it the idiot check, get rid of all the glaring typos. You cannot be Tarantino. Tarantino's the only guy who can get away with, you know, horrible, like not horrible writing, but horrible grammatical errors. <laughs> Right. So you've got you've got your friends look at it. I mean, and this is where I guess we should say, you know, if you have like a writer's group, that would be great. Don't hand it to your girlfriend or mom or dad. Exactly. Or, your or, mom will always think it's good no matter what. <laughs> really? Because my mom actually said it was good. I'm just I'm just kidding. But uh, get some people that have experience, uh, even people that you only kind of sort of know that, that you're friends with, maybe the people that you don't see all the time so that you're not like influenced by their day-to-day -day life and you can just send it off and get a, get an honest approach. But you've got the idiot check done. Uh, there's pitch fest coming up. There's writing competitions. Uh, now, uh, some of the good things about writing competitions, and I believe you and I might have discussed this a little bit before, uh, with writing competitions, your, your likelihood of winning is not that great, no, even if you have a strong script, because you never know the judges might not be into it. But one of the nice pleasant effects of these screenwriting competitions is a lot of them actually provide you some form of coverage so you're getting uh an opinion from someone you have no like no idea who they are uh they're giving you an honest opinion and it's not from a friend it's definitely something great to you know work from at a later date yeah i mean so there's tons of writing competitions all across the country probably hundreds maybe thousands i would say depending on where you're looking and you pay X number of dollars. I think it's what, like a hundred bucks, fifty to hundred bucks, depending on the size. Usually between like, I've, the lowest I've seen is around forty, but yeah, it's usually between fifty and a hundred dollars. Okay, so you package off your your script. Either sometimes they request physical copies, sometimes they request multiples, or just like a PDF that you email in. You pay you pay your cash, and you wait six to eight weeks, depending on you know the the competition itself. Any number from, you know, one to six people will read the script depending on the competition. And like you said, if you're going to enter a competition, I would say do the ones that you get a little bit of coverage back, even if it's like 20 extra bucks, because for 20 bucks, you know, you could get one page, five pages, four pages of, you know, notes back, whether you agree with the notes or not. If there's just one idea, one great suggestion, they might not be totally, you know, uh, executable but if there's one thing that makes you think different about your script for that extra 20 bucks then it's then it's worth the investment but i wouldn't maybe recommend you know spending a hundred dollars extra for for feedback or something like that but you're right i mean these these competitions they're they're real added value other than you know being able to say that you won them if you win them and you know the you know cash money and prizes um is you know the chance to get an, another objective opinion on what you've done uh, that's outside of your your comfort zone. Um, maybe talk about you know what it what it means to win some of these writing competitions. Like what are the some of the stuff that you get? And you're really gonna have to educate me here because I haven't looked at writing competitions for a while. Um, I just really don't really believe in them because I like my money in my bank account and I feel that I got a good network of friends and I kind of know when my stuff is shit. So maybe, I don't know, tell me about writing competitions. I mean, you're, you're excited about them, I can tell. Right, now again, it really comes back down to the coverage. If it's just about, um, well, with the exception of something like the Nickel Fellowship, where 
Well, I even have, um, I would say, a friend on Twitter at the moment who's actually been a runner-up uh, in the Nickel Fellowship competition. And one thing I learned from him was that you have to have other material backing up your script as well. Like A lot of agents aren't just looking for one screenplay. They're looking for a quality of writing, uh, a, a unique voice. And from that, they want to know what else you have with you. Yeah, I mean... It's. I think this the 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 competition thing is like getting your foot in the door. I don't. I I do. I, I mean, I don't know. What do you think? Right. Like with most of the competitions, uh, the reward in the end is uh, usually like uh, I'm thinking of. There's an April conference coming up here in Toronto for screenwriters. Uh, the competition reward is actually having a, a lunch with an agent. Right. So it's it's really uh, you're you're fighting to get your script in so you can get an interview for a job at a future date. So, but do you even really consider it as an interview for a job at a future date? I mean, what do you think, like how much value do you put in that lunch with the agent? I mean, I've got my thoughts, but I want to hear what you think. Uh, really? Uh, I think you have to have a unique voice more than a, a great script or a great, uh, high concept idea. You have to have a number of ideas backing up. Like you can't show up to, uh, well, we've been to these pitch competitions before, and you can't just sit down with one idea because you can get rejected just based off of the fact the studio is not interested in that genre. So you, you can either waste the next 10 minutes or you can have something else that might interest them. Yeah, so that comes back down to research and stuff. But let's let's talk yeah. specifically about you know the reward of getting a lunch with an agent. You know, how much value does you know do you hold in that? Um, is that like? as good as getting like a thousand bucks is that like an opportunity that you know that you that you know that you you would psych yourself out for it's like oh my god i won now i gotta have lunch with this agent what am i gonna say like i don't know what goes through your mind when you hear that like you know and the winner of this competition will get lunch with joe smith of joe smith agency literary incorporated like what do you think i'm trying to think of how to respond to that question uh it's more of a you can't expect to, um, even if you win the competition, you can't ex expect yourself to actually win <laughs> at a job or as a career. It's Again, it's a stepping stone. Uh, just the fact that you're getting to talk to an agent might get you more of an idea of what else is going on in that town. Yeah, I mean, what I would say, and of course my jadedness probably came through in the setup, Yeah, <laughs> um, was, you know what? It's, it's You're meeting with a person, okay? Let's just... Think about what that is first. First, you're going to have to survive an hour, just kind of meet with the person. So you, God, you don't want to sit down and say, so you're going to buy my script? You're going to sign me as a client? Am I going to make, you know, a dump truck of money? Like, is that going to like roll up in my backyard? Am I going to be set for life? It's like, slow down. First, you're talking to somebody who may or may not want to be there. I mean, it's cool that you won. They're just obligated, exactly. Yeah, I mean, I'm sure they're, they're happy that you won, and it's cool that they get to meet the writer, but... You got to look at this stuff as, as an advice session. You know, it's like, so you want, you want the script, good for you. You know, what's next? I guarantee that's kind of like the question or like, you know, so tell me what else you got in the hopper, what else you've been working on. They may not have even read the winning entry. I mean, they just may have exactly. said, yeah, yeah, okay, you can put my name, you know, in association with the contest and I'll go to lunch with somebody. No problem. Sure, it'll happen. You know, like you don't know what the scenario is. So, it, you know, it's cool that you get a one-on-one -on -one chance, but I would say... Don't try to expect to be rich after it. Don't expect to have a sale, but come prepared with like a huge list of questions. You know, uh, it doesn't matter how like naive or, or like rookie kind of sounding the questions are. Just take advantage of the opportunity. I mean, when I go to Pitch Fest and we can talk about these, like you said, uh, oh, you, you can get rejected with one idea. So I have more. Half the time I go to meet with people just so I can meet the person, develop that relationship with them you know, stand out, be memorable in some way and uh, just get advice from them. I mean, the last time I went to Pitch Fest, I didn't have my name on the badge. You know how you get a badge and it says, you know, in your case, Mike Gorman, a.k.a. Johnny Blue. Um, <laughs> mine said um, Batman. I just, I, I, when I, that will, they'll remember you for that alone. <laughs> yeah, I signed up and, you know, they said, okay, what do you want your badge to say? And I put Batman. And they're and everywhere I went, everybody's like, "Hey, Batman! There goes Batman!" You know, and everybody knows me. So when after all those meetings in LA um, that I had on the on the pitch fest, I came back to Vegas and I was sending all my follow up, uh, you know, material and stuff, and just thank you notes. I'm like, "Hey, you, you might remember me from from pitch fest. I I was Batman." So right away, 
you know, you branded yourself. So be memorable when you have a chance to meet people. But, you know, if you're getting to sit down with lunch with an agent, really utilize that chance to learn about them, what they want, what they think the industry wants. And then, and this is going to sound kind of like infomercial-ish, but if, if you've re- read any books on negotiation, it's all about getting people on the same side of, of an idea and not tackling it one against one another when you're trying to figure out who's right, but you know, working together as a team. So bring them around to your side and, and sell them with your passion. I mean, what, what do you think, what would go through your head if, Mike, you know, you've got... Uh, interview with a lunch, you know, a lunch, a lunch interview, or you know, a lunch meeting with an agent in a couple hours. What would you want to ask them, for example? Right now, uh, for example, uh, this is actually a great idea. Since uh, that April exposition I told you about uh, here in Toronto, yeah, uh, the prize is actually with an agent I've already had interviews with back in the day when we had left Sheridan as students. So uh, it, it's just ironic that the reward is someone I've already been interviewed with, and. What I'd really ask him is, what is the industry looking for? Like, especially in Toronto, here they're not really looking for feature film scripts, obviously. It's a lot about net- network television and selling uh, television shows down to the States. Right. Well, I mean, are, are we allowed to say who this agent is? Because I'd be curious to know at this point. Um, who, Actually, who's... yeah. Uh, his name is Glenn Coburn. Oh, Rick, Glenn uh... Coburn. Yeah. I mean, that's that's the first agent that I ever met. And he, <laughs> and he said, work at Starbucks if you ever want to be a writer. That's pretty much what he gave me as advice as well. Just uh, try to get a job that you don't have to worry about when you clock out. Yeah, exactly. Um, it's interesting you say Toronto's looking for lots of lots of TV stuff. And of course, as an agent, that's what you want your writer doing. So you can make residuals on all the scripts and you know, you'd know you be guaranteed, I don't know, four or five, maybe if you're one of the key writers per season and stuff like that. But uh, you know that that's a writing competition kind of thing. Let's talk specifically about pitch fests. First, let's take it back to square one. What is a pitch fest so everybody knows and can get on, on the same page with it? Well, whenever I've been asked what a pitch fest is, uh, the best way I can describe it, it's like speed dating with agents. Okay. And producers and production companies. and Right, exactly. And um, what I learned, especially after my first go around on that first time we went down, uh, I learned that it's not really about selling your screenplay. It was really about selling your passion, as you mentioned earlier. It's really about showing yourself as a personal brand, just be... Just try to be charming. Well, I mean, Johnny Blue in your hand, Mikey Gorman, you know, gets up to the table. How can people not smile? And, you know, it's it's funny. You know, I joke about, you know, bringing a glass of scotch, but I've seen people bring bottles of tequila and shot glasses to tables right, it, and you do shots. And I've seen people bring like desserts. So, right. I mean, w- what do you think about that tactic? I mean, imagine what you're like as a producer you're, you're seeing all these people come and sit down with you and, t- and they're telling you their great idea and then all of a sudden a guy comes over with like a cheesecake or, or like a bottle of tequila. Right, like uh, at the last uh, Screenwriters Expo, it should have been a good, great clue to me actually. Uh, between every uh, pitch fest break, like at lunchtime, you go to the bar area and it would just be all the agents, producers, all having drinks. Yeah, I mean, that that's where you make the contacts. When I was at Pitch Fest, uh, the Great American Pitch Fest, which I keep telling you you got to go to because I do believe it's the best one and the most. Right. Uh, and I, unfortunately, the Screeners Expo, I believe, is completely defunct at this point. Yeah, it is. The the Golden Pitch Expo by uh, Screenwriting Magazine, which is also defunct, is, is is gone. And that's the one we went to where you actually book times and appointments. And, you right. know, and I, I was at the very last one, and you could tell it was going to be the last one just because, unfortunately, uh, the Toronto International Film Festival was going on the exact same week as right. the Expo. Pitch fest. So all of the you know producers and agents they were busy up in Toronto where I just was at. Ironically, yeah, they were all up there busy trying to buy actual completed films. Yeah, so they come to Toronto, you go to LA. Now you're kind of talking to their assistants, which is normal as well. I mean, and a lo- sometimes a good thing actually. <laughs> yeah, I mean because I think it takes a lot of the pressure off, and you can be more personable. I mean, I can't stress enough that you're talking to people. You mentioned the bar thing; people are drinking at lunch. I mean, I went. Uh, to to the hotel bar, everybody else went, you know, to the cheap stuff across the street in, in Burbank to get like fast food or something for lunch or, or Subway or something. And I just went to the bar, had a salad, and beside me were like two producers. Just talked to them, you know, it was chill, and um, they were talking about Toronto and stuff. And of course, you know, I was fr- I'm from that area, but live down here now, and we're talking about other things. And sure enough, you know, they're one of the companies I end up wanting to pitch to or plan to pitch to after the lunch break. 
So I don't pitch them right there. It's like, oh, cool. Yeah, you guys are doing this, that, and the other. They're like, yeah, that's what we're looking for. I'm like, well, tell you what, on the surface, let's see if you can save me about 10 minutes on the waiting line. I got this idea. It's kind of like this. What do you think? They're like, yeah, yeah, that should be cool. I'm like, cool. Let's, let's, you know, let's have a drink, relax, and then we can worry about that crap later. I'll come visit your table later this afternoon. So, you know, respect the people when you do run into them outside of the, the scenario, for lack of a better word. Uh, give them their space. And just treat people like people, man. I mean, people forget that. I mean, I see people in costumes at Pitch Fest, and it's like, God, I don't want Snow White coming up to me and just being all chipper and cheery because that's what her, you know, script is about. It's like, it's driving me, it's putting me off as a writer, let alone how a producer must have to react to somebody putting that effort in that's kind of gone sour. What do you think? Right. And that method's even uh, not worked very well for big companies. Like, I do recall Microsoft at one point uh, taking uh, actors dressed up as Master Chief and going to all the studios delivering a screenplay. And we both know that uh, Halo is nowhere near being made into a feature film at this point. And that's coming from one of the richest companies in the world with a big PR team. That's pretty rough. I mean, isn't that the one that uh, Peter Jackson was working on for a while, too? Uh, well, it's a kind of a long story with the Halo series. Uh, I remember reading an Alex Garland draft, which was excellent. And if you watch uh, the latest Dread film, he kind of took a lot of the elements from Halo where you don't see him take the helmet off ever. And he kind of just brought it over to Judge Dredd. And it's, I highly enjoyed both, like, both the script and the film. I, I haven't seen Dread yet. I hear once it settles down, because it's kind of like they're, they basically go into one building and work their way up, don't give anything away, but I hear once it kind of settles down to that point, it actually works fairly well. Uh, I enjoyed the heck out of it. It was uh, at a TIFF just this uh, just this summer. Right. I was at the midnight screening in 3D. Uh, if you like movies like RoboCop, for example, it really knocks it out of the park. Okay, well now I'm excited. I'm a huge fan of the original RoboCop. Not so excited about the remake coming out, but uh, that's another discussion. Um, Let's talk a little bit about um, a documentary that's starting to make it make its rounds a little bit. It's called Room 237. It's, it examines some of the messages within the film, of course, by Stanley Kubrick. Um, what are your thoughts just on the surface <clears throat> of that documentary? Well, um, I noticed a lot of the uh, interview subjects in that film were more conspiracy nut than uh, Kubrick fans. And uh, one thing I will defend some of the uh, conspiracy nuts in that film, uh, I felt the uh, director, uh, Rodney Asher, kind of made a straw man argument where he didn't actually provide all of the evidence. And I put, I'm making air quotes right now for evidence. Okay. But uh, <laughs> uh, when it comes to like the Apollo, um, you know, the moon landing hoax, there's actually a lot more like pseudo evidence supporting that argument that than was provided in the film. In fact, you could probably make a whole feature film about that conspiracy theory alone yeah i mean for for those of you who don't know room 237 like i said examines all the ulterior motives and agendas supposedly that stanley kubrick uh instituted when he was making the shining uh which of course was based on the stephen king book so stuff like you know revealing or not revealing uh the truth behind the apollo landing in, in the choice of you know the clothes that the kids wear or the the actual room number because 237 wasn't the original number in the book. Uh, the original number in the book was 217. But 237, there's 237,000 miles between us and the moon. And, of course, this is the conspiracy theory that says that Kubrick shot the moon landing that everybody saw. So there's there's tons of you know different people saying that this is what's going on in the film. But what I'm, what I'm curious to talk to you about as a writer, as somebody who's directed stuff, you know... And the crux of all that argument in that doc is that Kubrick was meticulous enough that he had enough control to do all this stuff. So if once you buy into that, that's only when you know the rest is feasible. If you say, no, he didn't have that much control, which is maybe hard to believe because we all know what kind of a filmmaker he was. Right. Uh, all I point out right there is uh, there's a short, it's not a short film, I believe it was a documentary as well called uh, Stanley Kubrick's Boxes. And it was just about his warehouse of box after box. He was he pretty much had a photo, uh, Google Maps style of every location in Britain. You could more or less. So he, uh, he'd be the prime example of a director slash hoarder. Okay, so <laughs> he he likes his stuff. He's he's very meticulous. 
there's maybe or maybe not lots of messages within that film and his other films. I mean, realistically, as a writer, how much of that stuff can you put into a film? As a writer, I don't think there's... I really think, of, especially with Room 237, uh, a lot of the theories were just reading into it way, way too far, and it makes it a really amusing documentary. But as a writer, I really don't think you can dense that much of a... Uh, that many, especially, that many theories into one script. So, I mean, this maybe gets a little bit of the kind of follow-up stuff that I wanted to ask you about. You know, what kind of writing style do you prefer? Because I can see a script that might try to thematically include this stuff, like, you know, the carpet in every room is, hex, you know, hexagonal, or, you know, the every column you see is Roman, except for one, which is, I don't know, like, you know, Grecian or something. Right. But, you know, what kind of writing style do you prefer? Do you, and I'm going to loosely say, like, the Shane Black style in your face, like, uh, he drives up in, in a brand new Mercedes, the kind of car I'm going to get when I sell the screenplay. I think that was the kind of like the lethal weapon line or something like that. Or the character lives in the mansion, the kind of house that I'm going to, I'm going to have once I make it as a writer. Um, or do you like the Walter Hill short punchy approach? Like what, uh, or is like full of prose and description and like very colorful. Like what does it for you? Right now I, I found actually when I started off, I was really into Walter Hill's very, you know, to the point, uh, minimalist style of writing. Yep. But then as time grew by, especially when, uh, gentlemen such as Tarantino start getting on the scene I started to think of it more as uh, you're selling yourself as a brand I hate using the word selling yourself but <laughs> <laughs> but just the idea that uh, your your personality is coming onto the page a lot more when I read a Walter Hill script which I love his scripts I don't identify Walter Walter Hill so much as I identify Shane Black like when you read a Shane Black script like Last Boy Scout you know it's his without his name even being on it so I mean, maybe talk a little bit about Walter Hill. Um, like, what, what, what's some of the stuff that he's done, for example, so people would know? Uh, the first thing I'm thinking of is Alien. So, yeah, so Alien, I mean, it starts off, it's like dark, cavernous, you know, uh, hallway. You know, no life anywhere. And I, I'm racing right now to kind of pull up a script that I'm working on. And it's somehow evolved into a Walter Hill kind of thing where I've got very short, punchy statements, and I'm scrolling and scrolling. Uh, yeah, so here's an example, okay? He scrolls through his contacts, stops on Mitchell. He pushes it. It doesn't ring. He checks He checks his signal. No bars. So, like, you know, really, like, punchy, short, uh, dramatic. And there's, there's even other ones, like, plastic sheets cover various cabinets. Bits of drywall and tool lay everywhere. Thick dust hangs in the air. It's a maze of construction. You know what I mean? So... That's like the kind of a Walter Hill style versus like Tarantino, which would be something like what? Uh, he would actually at times spend a whole page. And you would actually be told in a screenwriting book more or less that this is something you do not do. He would spend a whole page with no dialogue, just description of the scene. And why do you think people frown against that? I mean, there's obvious reasons, but... Uh, for One of the biggest problems is that we run by the one page represents one minute. So when a writer writes in that style, it's really hard to estimate how long that scene is. Uh, on the other hand, it's kind of funny that I, uh, I just re recently reread the uh, Matrix screenplay and the Wachowski siblings, uh, there's a, you might recall the scene where they're going into the, uh, uh, the hallway and there's a huge gunfight and Trinity's jumping off walls and all that. Yeah. In the script, it runs to maybe half a paragraph. Like, it's maybe two sentences. They walk into the room and shoot the place up, and then they go in the elevator. Well, that, that's funny. That reminds me on uh, episode three, the, the Star Wars film Revenge of the Sith, there's a you know, behind-the-scenes kind of documentary into you know, that final fight between Anakin and Obi-Wan. Right. And, and George comes in at the beginning of it and lays down like the whole draft. He goes, there it is. The first draft is done, Revenge of the Sith. And uh, then he pulls out, you know, the section that they're going to start working on. He's like, oh, that's about two pages. And, of course, it's a 12-minute sequence. He goes, but I cheated a bit. There was a lot of they fight in there. <laughs> you know, like, it doesn't, uh, it doesn't get much more than that. But, you know, you, you'll read a lot of books, and they say don't, you know, take so much time about the choreography because if you're not making it, then somebody else will figure that out. Get to the, get to the points, the things that matter, like... That same script that I that I read you some sentences from, there's a there's a bit of a, a sports component to it. So it was like football in particular. So it's like, uh, huts the ball, passes it off to somebody, 
and then like the result of, of the play. So it's like ABC, you know, right. it's, it's not like hugely colorful because, you know, it, if I'm selling it, it's going to get rewritten. So I'm just trying to save pages at that point. Right. And I also find with a lot of screenplays, like I'm thinking of, you know, the classic Chinatown, Robert Towney, uh, the way he wrote those opening scenes, uh, it's very, uh, it's about developing character more like as a writer, you should be developing character more than the action sequences. Yeah, I, I think so. Because for any script to get made, you got to get an actor interested. The plot, exactly. the plot can be there and, you know, an actor might say, oh, this is going to be cool to shoot. But if they're not falling in love with the character and his reactions and, uh, you know, the, the way that he's coming across on the page, the film's not going to get made, really. Right, and that's kind of the way you need to think of a screenplay, too, is it's it's actor bait more than agent bait or film bait. You know, it's you're trying to get an actor who really wants to do this film more than anything else. Okay, so we've talked about writing competitions. We've talked about Pitch Fest. We've talked about writing on spec. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to play a little kind of fun scenario with you. You're a writer that... Uh, that me, who represents the studio, value values greatly. Okay, so okay. I've I've called you into a boardroom meeting, and I'm I'm gonna say, Mike, I've got uh, Mike, I got a bunch of ideas that our research department has said are gonna make for great audience pleasers. I know that you don't have any prepared material, but I just want to hear your take off the cuff, or maybe there's something that you've always wanted to do that you hear, or maybe you can combine two films, you know, that that have been made, and, and you know. Uh, merge the concept into it. So according to my research here, Mike, um, I'm, I'm looking for something that's, you know, like a big budget action script, but it's based on the thousand and one nights, the like a, Arabian kind of tales. What do you think? What's your take on that? What's the first thing that comes to mind? First thing that comes to mind, uh, I instantly think of the Aladdin story that you could capitalize off of. Uh, but then we've already done Prince of Persia in a very similar way. Unfortunately, I'm not very familiar with 1001 Nights outside of that. Okay, it's okay. I mean, <laughs> the research department has given, has given me a lot. And I should tell everybody listening, these are actual pitches that go out every week, to depending on the, the, the list that you sign up for. And this is where I'm drawing my quote-unquote research from. And it's really just to give you an insight into what companies are looking for and uh, how diverse they are. But as a writer, I'm putting Mike in the hot seat because I'm testing his kind of ability. Testing, I mean, well, not really. Just <laughs> asking his ability you know, to, to, to think uh, off the cuff and basically seal the deal. It's like, Mike... You know, I got some research. Okay, maybe uh, you can't write an Arabian tale script for me, but you know, I know you want to make some money, so let's try to hit one out of the park here. Um, let's see what else I got next here. I got okay. I, I'm looking for a completed feature-length teen suicide drama script. I know you don't have anything. Talk to me about that. And I'm not looking for material that's you know uh, will be easily adapted to fit. I'm only interested in dramatic material that deals with the topic of suicide and features teen characters. Uh, go and it's got to be under a million dollars. Okay, I can think of a story working from that. A uh, high school suicide pact. T tell me, tell me a little bit more. Like, okay, so high school suicide pact. I, so we're in high school. We got like a group of friends. Is it like everybody drinking Kool Aid? What drives them to that? Well, uh, what I would find as a funny example is I keep thinking of the film Juno and how that was about a teenage pregnancy, but. After that film came out, it really was kind of disturbing how all these teenage girls were making these pregnancy packs for after their prom. So they were trying to rush their lives ahead of themselves just because of a film setting an example. So what you're saying is, if you know, if we don't get laid at prom, we're we're gonna kill ourselves. I, I mean, think you got it on the head. <laughs> okay, okay. So I, I, I'm gonna get marketing on that. We'll get the poster made up, and then we'll work to the screenplay backwards. Okay. So the next thing I'm looking for, according to my research. Uh, I'm looking for a feature-length, broad audience comedy script in the vein of a John Hughes movie, uh, and it should only garner a PG or PG-13 rating. Go ahead. What do you got for me? Ooh, a PG-13 rating with John Hughes. Maybe back in the 80s you could pull that off with his sense of humor. Nowadays, it would almost automatically get an R. Like, I almost think Breakfast Club would be pushing an R rating at this point. Uh, but I really think you could tell a John Hughes story in junior high just as you know, the kids are going through puberty and teenage, you know, before they've even hit the age of 60, before they get cars, when they're running around on bicycles, you know, the humiliating stage. Right, right, right. The, the awkward stage. Okay, okay. I'm yeah. writing I'm writing all this down because, you know, I got to go back to my boss and he's going to say, okay. you know, what, what did Mikey Gorman come up with? And I guess, well, 
we 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 struck out on the Arabian Nights thing, but <laughs> I got I got Teen Suicide Pack, and now I got John Hughes Junior High Awkward Stage. Okay, I got a couple more, so just just stay with me, okay? Now this one is gonna come out of left field. Um, apparently, our researchers think that it, uh, if if we had a feature length, broad audience animated script that's family friendly but not kids specific. Uh, that would be great. Now, basically, they're saying, you know, do you have anything in the vein of Ratatouille or Up, but not VeggieTales? If you had something like that, that, that we might be able to make that. What do you think? But not VeggieTales. Yeah, so do you have another Pixar film in your pocket? You know, can, can you just make a Pixar film up on the spot? <laughs> <laughs> oh, that, that sounds so easy, especially when they hit near perfection almost every time. Okay, okay, so maybe, <laughs> maybe it's not fair to... For, for, for my researchers to, to throw out to the masses the writing world that if you have a Pixar film, we'll make it. That, that might not be fair. Okay, uh, we'll scratch that one too. I'll tell them to rethink of it. Okay, company, here, here, here's, here's what the company needs. Okay, more research, more research. I'm looking for a completed feature-length script or like a feature-length idea. And it's got to be shot or include scenes that are located in the Redwoods, uh, Redwood Forest in Northern California. I, I'll take any genre. But I think there's some tax credits, or I got an in with the with the national park there. Um, so give me an awesome feature set there. But I've only got 250k to do it. Well, you might have to cheat my idea just a little bit, but I can imagine quite an uh, entertaining idea involving tree hunters. Where, uh, as we know, the redwoods are kind of a uh, uh, and would you word them as an endangered tree? <laughs> yeah, it's it's. I would say it's an endangered tree. But I got 250k. And I want to go shoot in a national park. Don't worry about insurance costs or security or your lugging gear or, or setup or generators or anything like that. 250K total. What, what do you think? So just tree huggers? Is, is, is that what we're going with? I was thinking more in the vein of uh, there was just recently a film with Willem Dafoe where he actually had to go down to Tasmania. Great film. Hunt. Great film. The Hunter. Exactly. Uh, I'm just thinking of something in that vein of someone taking the last tree. Okay, so the last tree hunter, Willem Dafoe, set in Northern California. Lots of tension trying to catch that tree. 250K. I don't know if he'll sign on for that much, but we'll, we'll see what we can do. The industry is hurting overall. It's, it's, a new, it's the economy, right? The economy. The economy. I, I can say that everybody believes that it's tough times and they'll take less. It's okay. The economy. Uh, okay, got, got a couple more. Got a couple more. Looking for a dark romantic comedy script. Unconventional stories that have some sort of dark twist to it. Maybe something in the vein of Silver Linings Playbook, uh, Gross Point Blank, or, you know, like a John Waters rom-com. What do you got? Okay, I actually oh, two, have... Oh, $2 some... million. Dollars. I've only got $2 million for this one. Okay, well, I actually have something like this um, in a short script form. Uh, I call it Happy Mondays. Uh, it features a, a rich uh, owner of a fast food chain, referred to as Happy Mondays. Uh, it's got, like, this uh, gorilla that runs around on Monday nights and entertains the children. Problem is, you find out this gorilla man has been a, like a pedophile, kind of ruins the whole image of his company. At the same time, his uh, the owner of the company, uh, his wife is actually trying to murder him and take away his money, but it's actually dwindling. She doesn't even realize it. Okay, okay, I'm I'm writing it all down. I'm gonna forward it on. I like it. It's uh, it's dark. It's quirky. It's it's got potential. I can see the poster now. I can see it. Let, let, let's keep moving. I, I, this, there's this Fast and the Furious franchise that's going to have like seven films or something out like that. Is, is that right? Is, have you heard of the Fast and Furious? I think I've heard of it. So, so marketing <laughs> has come back to me. They've said, okay, there's got to be something to this. So I'm looking for a completed action thriller script that contain car chasing scenes or street racing scenarios. I don't care about character, plot. Do you have a script or an idea with those elements? No, but no it, budget restrictions on this. It's it, we'll, we'll determine it depending on you know how much character stuff you want to put in. Well, I'm thinking of combining Fast and the Furious with extreme sports. I call the idea skitching. Okay. Uh, have, okay. Have some gentlemen on, uh, you know, skateboards and rollerblades, uh, underground racing. It's all about getting the skater past the finish line. Okay. Okay. Yeah. A little, yeah, bit, I of, can, a little I can, bit of death race. So a little bit of death race, like on a, on, a, on a skateboard, BMX kind of Generation X kind of thing, X Gamers jackass kind of guys exactly okay okay you know what i like this we can probably get knoxville to play play the mentor you know we can maybe tie the ryan dunn thing in or tragedy in his life and he doesn't want to send another kid on that path yeah 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 i like this this is this is good okay last one and i know this is i know you're gonna get this i know this is the one that we're gonna assign you to write as you leave the office today okay you ready i'm ready okay 
I need a com- I need a feature length script, live action about a panda. Go. Vampanda. Vampanda. Uh, pan Panpira. Vampire pandas versus were puppies. Were puppies versus vampire p- pandas. I like it. Um, I, I can Wait. I can work on it. Are these the kind of vampires that that glitter and shine, or um, I, I, are they just like like are, how are the how are these vampires different? I, I know they're pandas. I know they're pandas, but how are these vampires different? I got to sell it to the marketing people. I'm gonna go way out there and go the opposite direction. They're like normal vampires. Okay, that's Classic like stuff. that's like never been done before. That's like never. People will forget that it's been done before. It'll be like something new all over again. I, I like it. I, I think we got a home run on this one. Mike, th- thanks for playing that little scenario with me. Folks, those are actual requests coming out from studios and production companies. And like I said before, we, we got into that little scenario, heightened reality there. <laughs> uh, I just wanted to showcase the diversity of stuff that people are asking for. Um, and really, you know, it goes back to how we started this conversation about writing on spec. You know, write what you love. Uh, if somebody can ask for a script on pandas, then I'm sure somebody will be looking for a script with some sort of element that you've got. I mean, the, the, these scenarios were like, give me, you know, an Arabian Nights tale to give me something with car chases in it. Right. And the reason something like Arabian Nights is so uh, popular is that it, it already is, um, it's public domain. So they can just pluck the idea out of nowhere and it already has instant recognition by the audience. Yeah. There, there's branding and everybody knows Alibaba and Aladdin and in basically the thousand and one tales, Sinbad, that kind of thing. Exactly. So, so Mike, I am going to wrap up the interview and we always wrap up our interview. Maybe it's, maybe it's another kind of quick game that we play. It's a, it's, it's a what if scenario. Uh, three quick questions. Have fun with it. I, although we did have a lot of fun with that last one. Um, <laughs> okay, question one. You get to rewrite or remake any flick that's ever been made. Which one and why? Ooh, okay. Give me a second for that one. Okay. <laughs> wow, this should actually be an easier question than usual. <laughs> <laughs> it's more of which one to go with. Well, g- give us give us an idea. Well, I think you and I have had conversations about Batman, for example. I would like to see someone take it back to literally old school Adam West style. Treat it like a kid's movie, PG. Not so serious. <laughs> so, Not so serious. So you would basically reboot Batman, Adam West kind of tongue and face, pow and biff and zap. Exactly. That's one thing I miss is the, uh, maybe not the sh- uh, Schumacher style, but ex- you really need the uh, Batman adventures, the Batman and Robin dynamic duo feel okay okay yeah um, i'm sure there's an audience somewhere for that um yeah maybe i'm the, thinking cg animation maybe may, maybe the the neil adams crowd I, I believe would probably love that kind of stuff okay sounds good second question i got for you you can work on any film past present or future what film and what role do you want honestly it comes it when I think of someone like Christopher Nolan, he, he's a brand in himself. Uh, I don't even w- bother watching the trailers to his movies. I just go to them. Okay. And I, I know the next film he's working on uh, involves artificial intelligence. Johnny Depp going into uh, uploading his brain, from my understanding, onto the internet as a consciousness. Okay. That al- that idea alone, I could probably write you five scripts for. <laughs> Okay, so you would want to work on Chris Nolan's next film, and you would want to be the writer. Definitely. Okay. But he'll, he'll take his brother, I understand. <laughs> well, they, they have a little bit of history together. It's okay, it's okay. Okay, last question I got for you. A little bit more fun, maybe not as serious, not as much on the line. Uh, if you could be any superhero, who, why that hero, or, and, and or how would you use that hero's powers to help with your, your uh, career or film goals? Aquaman, because there's nowhere but up. Aquaman, because there's nowhere but up. And how would Aquaman's powers help you with your, your film goals? I mean, you could spell out your screenplay using dolphins in the L.A. Harbor. <laughs> well, there, there would be some advertising potential there. I mean, you, you would probably get noticed doing something like that. So I can see, you know, you know arranging dolphins and starfish would, would draw the attention of people and maybe, you know, trigger a biopic or something. Uh yeah, I can see that. I'm just picturing Aquaman working at SeaWorld someday. Aquaman relegated to SeaWorld. Maybe maybe that should be a comic book on its own. Like an Directed Aqu- by Wes Anderson. It, it, I can see it already. Like uh, like almost like a Mermaid Man, SpongeBob style. 
exactly. where he's just retired and <laughs> working at SeaWorld because the Justice League no longer needs him. So, okay. They always go to the bar and leave him alone. Go to the bar and they leave, they leave Aquaman at SeaWorld to feed the fish. I like it. Okay, Mike. This this kind of concludes it. I I, I want to thank you for for doing this with me. It's uh it's been a lot of imaginable scenarios. I mean, we had to, you know, being a writer, it's hard to kind of collaborate on something. I know you and I haven't worked on something, but uh, I think we got through it. Uh, we talked about the writing process, the what it means to go to pitch fest and screenwriting competitions, how to talk to agents and and you know different writing styles and putting messages and whatnot in your script if it's realistic and then of course we we entertained uh the, the some of the pitches that are currently going around the requests before uh before everybody that was listening today so so thanks for being on the show man oh it was a pleasure thank you so everybody listen out there of course this is the trenches our ongoing series of interviews with filmmakers from around the world again my guest has been mike gorman it's been great having him thanks again for listening to our show on the wired in network coming to you every sunday we will see you again this time next week